Welcome to the Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart Podcast. Each week, we interview the best and brightest in physical therapy, wellness, and entrepreneurship. We give you cutting-edge information you need to live your best life, healthy, wealthy, and smart. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Karen Litzy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I am your host, Karen Litzy, and today's episode was recorded live at the Combined Sections meeting in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago, and I had the privilege to sit down with Dr. Mike Pasco. So if you're not familiar with Mike, he received his Ph.D. in neurophysiology from the University of Colorado at Boulder in December 2010. He then joined the Faculty of Physical Therapy program in the School of Medicine at the University of Colorado on Schutz Medical Campus. He teaches clinical anatomy and in his spare time loves hanging out with his wife, Stephanie, and their dog, Maya. So what do we talk about in this episode? If you don't know Mike, he's very, very active on social media, Snapchat in particular, and we do talk about that. But we discuss research highlights in the field of cadaver anatomy how Mike utilizes social media and live blogging during his anatomy courses, how the anatomical board serves anatomy education goals in Colorado, and cognitive principles of learning for success in PT school. This is a really fun discussion. He does some really innovative uh, teaching methods using Snapchat, and it just, it was a lot of fun to sit down with him and find out exactly how he seems to do all of this stuff. I always tell him, like, How are you so active all the time? And in this episode, you'll find out how and why he uses it with his students and the outcomes he's been having. So a huge thanks to Mike for coming on the podcast, taking time out of his really busy schedule at CSM to sit down and chat with us for the podcast. So I hope you all enjoy. Hey, everybody. This is your host, Karen Litzy, and we are coming to you live from the Combined Sections meeting in Washington, D.C., and I have the pleasure of once again seeing Assistant Professor Mike Pasco. I saw him late last year in Denver. So, Mike, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for coming on. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. So we read your bio, but what I would love to hear from you is a little bit more about yourself so the listeners kind of know where you're coming from and what, what we have in store during, for our talk today. Yeah, let me give you some things about myself that really just drive who I am and what I do. So I am a Colorado native, so uh, there's just a lot of fun things to do in Colorado, and I've managed to stay in a really awesome place. And uh, so there's a lot of fun to have there, and, and a lot of that fun I have with my family. So I'm married to uh, Stephanie Pasco. She's a PT, so she's the clinical um, half of uh, the marriage. And so we, we like doing a lot of things together, and we like keeping our two daughters busy as well. So very family driven and we, we've got a lot of fun with a five-year-old and a three-year-old girls so I like to bill myself as a minority in a sorority that's what that's what things look like around my house lots of pink and um, yeah so I, I basically am here at uh, CSM with Stephanie and we both get to go do our own things and check out the various different uh, talks uh, different posters different presentations and I've been able to come to CSM since I started at CU Anschutz in 2011 so awesome. yeah it's been a great conference it's great to catch up with old friends and make some new ones yeah. and so today we're only on day one of the conference but have you gone to any lectures or any poster presentations that really stand out in your mind yeah, I really wanted to see what Chad Cook and, and others w- had to say about predatory publishing. So that was very informative. I'm, I'm aware of the concept and fortunately have not fallen prey myself, but it was good to just see the numbers and how big of a problem it is. You could, you could call it an epidemic. So yeah, they yeah. packaged that really well. Yeah, predatory journals, predatory conferences, things like that. I mean, it's a thing and people fall for it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, they said that the analogy is everyone's got a rich relative in Africa that just died and wants to offer you a billion dollars. So it's a new spin on that old email tactic. Exactly, exactly. And it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. But 
hopefully their course kind of gave you a little bit of insight on what to watch out for. Yeah, if you go on to Twitter, which if you're not on Twitter, then I, I don't know what's going on. It's the best way to find out what's going on at the conference. Great hashtag APTACSM. And that's where a lot of us are sharing the real pearls from the session. So there's a lot to catch up on there. But uh, then following that was a real exciting meeting of a uh, special interest group with the Academy of Physical Therapy Education. And that's the Anatomy Educators Special Interest Group. So that uh, grew. Last year was the first year. There were maybe 50 of us. And now there's 133. So we're really uh, growing a nice base. And we're really starting to, to cut our teeth on what we want to define and how we want to really enhance PT education, specifically in the anatomy domain. Great. So now let's talk about that. So let's talk about your teaching background and what you're doing over there at the University of Colorado on Schutz Medical Campus. Yeah, so about 80% of my time on campus in my role is as a teacher. So I'm really striving for excellence there. And basically, uh, I started in 2011. They hired me with very little teaching experience at the professional level, but I really had a passion for teaching undergraduate students when I was a graduate TA. So that's where I first fell in love with teaching anatomy and then I got on board with CU PT and I teach PT anatomy that's my main role about 50% of my job is designing and delivering the content for the PT students but I've also been able to extend into the physician assistant and uh, medical student anatomy courses so that keeps me pretty busy it's a lot of gross anatomy it's lecture in the morning and then going into the lab in the afternoon and looking at the at the dissected donors Oh, I remember those days. Good times, I'm telling you. It's the most memorable and favoritest course of all PT students. Well, sure. I have to, do, uh, you know something, I, it actually was my favorite course, and I firmly believe every human being should take gross anatomy because you should know what's going on in your body. Yep. You should know how the equipment operates, and there's some real good research out there, and you know, a lot of people can identify where the heart is, but you ask them where the liver is, and that's where we need a little bit of improvement. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So now, outside of teaching, what other things are you working on? Any kind of research? Absolutely. And, you know, what I've learned from all the excellent mentoring I've had in my role is that you should really uh, cover your bases. And you should really... Uh, be optimized in what you're doing with your research as an educator. So what you do is you do education scholarship. So I walked away from bench research and neurophysiology, and, and now my laboratory is the classroom. So I do educational research. It's every bit as rigorous as looking through a microscope and uh, you know modifying genes in a lab. But basically, the students are my subjects, and I will take a, an idea that I think is going to be a way to improve my anatomy teaching. I'll design a protocol, get my IRB approval, collect the data, uh, get some graduate students under my mentorship to, to help run through the project. Sometimes we find a positive result and sometimes we don't, but we send those results out anyway. And I've been able to get some projects out the door. Uh, just a couple of highlights. There's a there's a type of photography called light field photography. So that's been really interesting to see how you can change the focal point of a cadaver photo after the photo's been taken. A lot of anatomy clustered together. So it's often hard to get everything in focus. So that gets around that. But also publishing on students using a wiki to organize their study materials and live blogging, actually. I got to do a lot of live blogging of a PT conference and we surveyed the the people using uh, viewing the coverage and they really uh, had positive uh, rankings and satisfaction with the coverage so I'm really promoting that and hoping that more PT conference organizers uh, jump on top of that to complement the Twitter and so how are you live blogging and how is that different I was gonna ask is that what kind of platform is that on yeah we use a platform called cover it live they're still out there uh, no conflict of interest no disclosure no relation but basically what you do with um, Live blogging is you can really issue more of a transcript of what's going on. There's no character limits like Twitter. Twitter is usually more about the bite-sized pieces, but uh, live blogging is much more of a script, and you can really capture a lot. You can integrate photos, and what's been really fun is to to capture the question and answer session mm -hmm. part of the session. The people really rated that as a really good feature of live blogging. And so you pretty much have to know how to type well to do that, though, yeah, right? It's, it's all about typing. So I mean, someone yeah. like me, it would like who has to look at yeah. the keys at the same time because oh, I never yeah. learned how to type. Yeah. 
that would be my that would be a problem. <laughs> Hunting and packing is hard, but the <laughs> the bigger skill is contextualization and knowing your audience. And it was real good for me to to learn about how to to interpret what a physical therapist was saying about uh, whiplash and uh, the anatomy of neck muscles and how that can be put together so that way a, a PT audience would benefit the most. So, yeah, that's a big skill as well. That's awesome. I, I've never heard of that. I mean, I don't think I can do it because, like I said, I can't really yeah. type. But I love the fact that it's long form. And so if I wanted to... if. If I wanted to watch you do this, how do you? Yeah. yeah. How do you do that? Um, like as yeah. not not for you as a person blogging, but as the consumer. So we have to get a marketing campaign out there, and what we ended up doing was just uh, promoting the the link to the web page uh, through social media. Got so it. okay. Fortunately, uh, people are very aware that conferences come with their own hashtags, and. People are having conversations around the conference leading up to the conference, so we took advantage of that. And we would just publish in, a, in advance. These are the sessions Mike is going to be covering, so come back this day at this time for the live coverage. The real beauty of this uh, platform, too, is you can play them back. Well, you don't play them back. You scroll through a timeline, yeah. and you get to look at the content that way. So it was really rewarding to know that you're helping people real-time, but for the busy clinician that can't step out of treating patients at 2 p.m. They could come in and look at it later. Oh, that's really that's good. All, sounds great. So aside from being a little more innovative in your teaching and in academia and in, in education, which obviously is is a must these days, Sure. what else are you doing as your role at CU or your role as, a, as an educator? So another real cool role that I, I took over uh, about a year ago was it's an administrative role, but it's for the State Anatomical Board of Colorado. I serve as the secretary treasurer, and so I oversee the day-to-day -day operations of the anatomical board. And basically, this is still educational because what we do with the anatomical board, our big mission is to serve the educational um, goals of anatomy education in the state of Colorado. So think of every healthcare profession program, PT, OT, MD, dental, uh, graduate programs. Whenever a program would like to use a donor for an educational resource, they approach us, they make a request. We take a look at how many donors we have available, and we're very fortunate in Colorado that we have a very large donor uh, pool, a large donor base, and I help assign the donors, and so indirectly, I'm able to impact thousands, thousands. of students a year with anatomy education simply by facilitating the use of cadaver dissection. That's awesome. It's been really cool. Very cool. I often wondered how that worked. Now I, well, at least now I know how it works in, in uh, Colorado. So you had mentioned earlier the use of social media. So if people are listening to this and they're not familiar with you, I obviously suggest following you on social media. Yeah. But how has your use of social media impacted the way that you teach and the way that you sort of view education in physical therapy? Yeah, so I incorporate social media into my teaching directly and indirectly. So directly... I have recognized that um, there's a real power behind this, this cognitive psychological principle called retrieval practice. So any way you can get your students to practice retrieving information without the learning materials in front of them, they're going to benefit. Studies have shown that for decades. So how am I going to, aside from doing like the polling audience response system, how can I really get their attention? And I found what's really um, successful is to use social media and people are doing Twitter, people are doing Instagram, but students really spend the most attention, pay the most attention to content on Snapchat. And if you're not familiar with Snapchat, the thing that makes it different, what sets it apart, is that the content disappears after 24 hours. So when you're doing retrieval practice, you don't need it necessarily for the student to preserve the questions and answers. They just need practice interacting with the content. It goes away and they know this. So there's something about the way the brain is wired that the brain pays more attention to ephemeral content. So they know it's going to go away. And so I, I push out questions during the semester and they get the question, they get the answer later. So it's great for the students, but it's great for me, the educator. I found with Twitter and Instagram, it really took so much time to perfectly create the right content. But everybody on Snapchat understands that it's raw 
and it's unedited and it's uncurated. So as long as I put the correct information out there, it's quality enough. So it's very quick, it's very rapid. And every time the students find out that I run an anatomy related Snapchat account, they, they can't believe it. They, they're at first they're in disbelief, like what's going on. But once I convince them that this is a, this is educationally based on sound pedagogy, they're on board and then I'll have a break from it and they'll bug me. We need more snaps, Pasco, uh, put some more content out there. So if you want to check out what I'm talking about, the, the handle, the username on Snapchat is anatomy snap. Um, all one continuous word, and I'm telling you, it's been really exciting. I collected data this summer. I'm uh, looking at the data now and hoping to see, number one, if students found it um, satisfactory, but number two, how did their exam scores um, look? Uh, they could have been the same. They could have been worse. They could have been better. The exciting thing is I've learned how to put a protocol together that allows me to level up beyond satisfaction, and did your learning change has your knowledge base changed so stay tuned for that publication awesome and now can you give an example of some of your snaps yeah so good. yeah give me a couple of examples so that people kind of get an idea of what you mean like what do you mean you're putting <laughs> stuff out for anatomy like just taking a picture of like a muscle or a dissected body yeah. so uh, give me an example but before you do, well, give me an example first, then I have another question. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it's good. So leverage, leverage the, the principles. You, you can get retrieval practice, and you can also get um, leverage examples and um, just like real-life examples. So you're at a table, you're going through the upper extremity anatomy, and you're between lectures, whatever you're doing as an educator, put your hand on the table and elevate your thumb and get the extensor pulleys as long as tendon to pop up. Take a picture, add text, what tendon do you see here? Draw an arrow. Then you can take it further. Just keep building, keep elaborating. What's the line of inquiry that the student would go through? How would you go through this at the cadaver? What anatomical region does this tendon define? Anatomical snuff box. The next snap question is, and what structures as a physical therapist are you most interested in finding in the snuff box? So then you can go through that. You can step through a very sequential uh, Socratic series of of snaps and then you can say okay everybody send me a snap of your snuff box if you so choose they'll usually do this without solicitation but that's an example so i think that's great and it actually leads perfectly into my next question is are you creating a curriculum for your snaps or is it just off the cuff you know i'm very mindful and aware that Doing things intentionally is the best way to go. So what I did for the summer is I did focus my snaps on a specific aspect of anatomy in the course, and that was blood flow diagrams. So I, I do look at my learning objectives, and those inform my teaching methods. So these snaps, although they seem frivolous and accessory, what they really do is they're a direct extension of being able to describe the path that blood takes from the left ventricle to a distant site in the body. So um, it is very informed, it's very intentional, it's in the curriculum, but you have to be mindful that not all students are gonna go there. It has to remain optional. I do not think it's appropriate to push your students into social media. There's a lot of valid reasons students don't wanna go there, but for the ones that are there, I found it's 90 to 95% of students. And you know what, it's a great way to role model and show them how to be professional and how to use social media in an appropriate way that's be that's beyond tearing down somebody's beliefs and ideals well said so there's a method to your madness is what you're saying there it's is, not yeah. it's not random like oh I stubbed my toe today I know I'm gonna do something on the foot <laughs> yeah exactly it. it's intentional and yeah it, there, it's been out for so long that it's it's just time that everybody had a good understanding of how to use it appropriately and and how we can really think about incorporating it into education I think that's a great way to incorporate into education, and hopefully people listening to this will now follow Anatomy Snap, no S, I follow you yeah, good stuff. on Snapchat, and I can say that there is, a, it's really interesting, it's really interesting, even as a, a more quote-unquote seasoned PT, because I feel like you can never have too much anatomy. It's continuing um, education, yeah. That's so great. Now, anything else that you're doing that's kind of outside of the box with your students or, um, or even without your students as far as furthering your education? I think that 
Another thing to, to bring up here is how there's a real need for physical therapists that are anatomy instructors to understand what is need to know and what is nice to know. Mm -hmm. So that's my second area of work. The, the first area is the technology integration, but I've really developed some nice um, ways to look at what do um, anatomists that teach physical therapy students need to teach their students. So um, I'm just looking at the data now, but I recently put out a survey to about uh, 200 people in the that are stakeholders for the CU physical therapy program. So we're talking faculty, clinical instructors, recent graduates, the two most recent classes. Do you, in your opinion, think that in your practice you need to name all 10 bronchopulmonary segments of the lung? That was an example of an objective for which most people rated no. Like, that is, that is not essential, so I take that feedback and I improve my curriculum. On the other hand, should a PT student be able to know, name every spinal segment that is serving a muscle, um, the myotomal innervation. And most people, the majority came back saying, yes, that's need to know. So it's been really nice not being a PT to survey a wide base of people. The next step is going to be to survey uh, the, the community at large to kind of level up the methodology, get a consensus document together, and then uh, present that uh, to, to the educators in, in the PT community. Great. Well, it sounds to me like you're up to some really fun stuff, and I look forward to touching base again when you have a lot of this data together and, and you're ready to present. So yep. is there anything that we didn't touch on? Well, gosh, let's see here. Anything else? I guess if you're really interested in body donation, it's oh, often yeah, it's yeah, often yeah. confused with, oh, my driver's license has a heart with a Y inside of it. I'm going to possibly be, a be donor. in yeah. a cadaver lab. but. That's organ donation, and that's totally separate. You do need to opt into whole body donation. And I, I go through this concept in a six-minute uh, TED Talk. And um, basically, if you, if you just search YouTube for Pasco um, TEDx, as in X-ray, TEDx Talk, uh, you'll find a nice little talk I was able to put together for TEDx Boulder um, in Colorado and just kind of let people know what body donation is all about. And the title of the talk is The Ultimate Gift because we have extreme gratitude to the individuals that yes. make this choice to, to give us the ultimate gift, the, the body that, that, they, that has served them all of their life and now will go on to serve healthcare professionals as they uh, work toward being able to, to take care and to treat those patients. I love it. So everyone, don't worry. We will have links to everything on the show notes under this episode uh, at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com so you'll be able to hear that TED Talk and, and get links to Mike and to see you on Shoots Medical Campus and all that fun stuff. So before we're, we wrap things up, I have one yep. more question. Yep. Given where you are now in your life and in your career, what advice would you give to yourself as a new grad? Or, or okay. someone, your students, like when you were a student, what advice would you give to yourself way back? Not way back, but. So the, there's, there's two I want to give you. One is um, more like the life side of things and learning to say no. Um, I had yes. definitely gotten myself in trouble. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm super passionate about teaching. And every time I was approached with a teaching opportunity, I rationalized how I could make it work. And I tricked myself and I got way overloaded with teaching. So I would go back and tell, you know, 27 year old Mike, like, you're going to have a lot of opportunities, uh, but there's a, there's a tactful way to say no. And even though that time may not be the right time, things to cycle back around, you'll get another pass at it if it was meant to be. And then the other, um, more practical for those of you that are PT students, those of you that are looking at getting into PT school, you have to look at your study techniques. So I've totally revolutionized the way I do office hours. When students come in and they've had a bad performance on an anatomy exam, and they say, I don't understand, I studied so much. I blow a whistle and I throw a yellow flag on the ground and I say, hold up. The penalty on the field is quantity does not equal good learning. So you have to look at these um, psychological cognitive psychological principles of learning and what got you through in undergrad will not get you through in PT school. The volume is too much. So in the show notes, I'll give you a link to a really excellent website that summarizes these key principles of learning. And you've got to look at your study habits and you've got to be prepared to change them. Otherwise, you're in for a really 
uh, painful and arduous um, path through your physical therapy curriculum um, and other programs that you might be pursuing. Amazing advice. Thank you so much. What's the name of the website? So, the, the, yeah, the name of the website is uh, Learning Scientist. And I believe if you just Google Learning Scientist, uh, yeah, you're going you're gonna to find a website that has principles of effective learning. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm sure the students and uh, myself will greatly benefit from that. So thank you. And now, where can people find you on Twitter? We know where they can yeah. find you on Snapchat. How about Twitter? Yeah, go ahead and look uh, for me at M Pasco, and M Pasco is P A S C O E. Don't forget the E. But you know what? If you're looking at the hashtag for the conference, I'm tweeting up a storm here, so uh, that would be a good place to catch some of my contributions and go from there. Awesome. Well, Mike, thank you so much for taking a time out at CSM, where we everybody's busy. I get it. We're all busy, so I really appreciate you for taking the time out, coming on the podcast, and sharing all this great info. So thank you so much. Yeah, my privilege, and thanks to you, Karen, for getting everyone together and being a, a vessel for getting this information out. Thank you very much. And to all the listeners, have a great couple of days and stay healthy, wealthy, and smart. Thank you for listening and please subscribe to the podcast at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com. And don't forget to follow us on social media.